Hi, and thanks for watching this message video. And don't forget to go through the life lesson that goes with it. And for those who can't make a Sunday, don't forget that there's a podcast of that sermon that goes along with this message video and life lesson. Today, we're continuing on in our series where we're looking at the differences between followers and fans. And the characteristic that we're looking at today is order. Now, when it comes to order, there are a variety of different definitions that go with order. For instance, if you were to look it up in the dictionary, you would find that the first definition of the word order is an authoritative direction or instruction, command, or mandate. And speaking of orders, one of the coolest stories in the Old Testament about orders is that of a Hebrew slave named Joseph, who actually interpreted the dream of the king of Egypt or the Pharaoh. And then, out of uh, kindness, Here's what the king or the pharaoh of Egypt did to openly reward Joseph for what it is that he did. Genesis 41, 38 through 40. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court and all my people will take orders from you. Only I, sitting on my throne, will have a rank higher than yours. So when it comes to the word order, as followers, we need to remember that Jesus has been given all authority, and therefore, he has the right to give us orders. And in fact, he has given us a lot of orders or commands or mandates that we're supposed to follow. In fact, that's one of the major differences between followers and fans, as we know, is that we will follow Jesus' orders. And maybe one of, if not the biggest command or order or mandate that he has ever given was in the Great Commission, where he gave all of us as disciples some very specific orders. Here's what we're told. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Shortly after Jesus said this to his original disciples, minus Judas, he was taken up into heaven, and ultimately all of them went about doing this very thing, baptizing people and teaching them to do all of the things that Jesus had taught them to do. Except for, if you know the story of those original disciples, they actually didn't travel much outside of the Jerusalem area until much later. And so when it came to the expansion of the church, so to speak, outside of that area to all of those other nations, well, that actually was through Paul and Barnabas, not those original disciples. And when these guys went out on their missionary journeys to plant churches, one of the things that they wanted in all of those churches that they had planted was order. Which actually brings us to the second definition, if you were to look up in the dictionary as to what order means, and it's this. A condition in which each thing is properly disposed with reference to other things and to its purpose or harmonious arrangement. Or in other words, Paul and Barnabas wanted every single person in the church to be properly disposed toward others in the church by knowing what their purpose is or knowing what the purpose is of other people in the church so that all of that would lead to a harmonious agreement or arrangement or order. In fact, here's how Paul tried to explain all of this using the human body as an illustration. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, 
while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. Even though Paul never specifically mentions it in this passage, throughout the whole entire thing, what he is asking is for everybody to be cognizant of everybody else in terms of what their part is, as well as their own part, and to do so by having the right attitude. Or in other words, that we're supposed to, when we recognize that this person has a different part in the body and therefore a different function, that we're not all gonna serve in the same function, but that as each of us serve in our own function, it really does help the entire body. That's when we start to have order within the body. But what it requires for this order is the right type of attitude where we never are looking at somebody and saying, I don't need you. And clearly all the body needs is me. In fact, look at what Paul said to the church in Philippi about this same type of attitude within the church. Philippians 2, 1 through 5. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? They make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress each other. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Jesus never displayed an attitude of selfishness or was never demanding with others, even though if there was anybody who ever had a right to be, it was Jesus. In fact, Paul states that Jesus emptied himself of his divine privileges. So in other words, the continual emphasis by Paul toward those, was, those within the church was that every follower must be willing to keep their personal attitude in check for the sake of order within the church. In fact, Look at what it is that the Apostle Paul stated about what God's desire is any time that the church gathers or meets. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the meetings of God's holy people. So when it comes to order, we know that there are orders that Jesus has given to us because he has all authority and we are supposed to pay attention to those. And when it comes to order, there is a proper disposition that you and I are supposed to have toward others, where we understand what their purpose is and what the overall purpose is, which is harmonious arrangement and agreement, and that when you and I understand our part in the body as well as somebody else's part in the body and that they're different, but that they work together, that brings order. Now, there's a third definition of the word order that a lot of people who are followers of Jesus don't like to hear, but nonetheless, we need to. And in the dictionary, we're told this. Order is conformity or obedience to law or established authority, absence of disturbance, riot, revolt, or unruliness. Now, the truth is, unless you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, are being asked to deny him or to disobey one of his primary commands, we are to be obedient to all governmental authorities that are established by God above us, which means we're not only supposed to be paying our taxes, but we're supposed to be very deliberately kind in the way that we speak about them. In fact, look at what it is that the Apostle Paul stated to the church in Rome, of all places, as well as to Titus, the pastor that he was developing. Romans 13, 1 and 2, and then 6 through 7. Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. Pay your taxes, too, for these same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to anyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them, and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Titus 3, 1 and 2. Remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. They must not slander anyone and must avoid quarreling. Instead, they should be gentle and show true humility to everyone. Make no mistake about it. The last thing that God wants to see is you and I as followers acting out in disobedience or without any kind of conformity to the governmental authorities that he has instituted or established. Or in other words, the last thing he wants for you and I are to be the kind of people who are exhibiting unruliness or rioting.
So let's sum up what it is that we have learned here today. Number one, Jesus has been given all authority, and therefore, whatever orders or commands that he has given to us, those are the things that we need to be carrying out for. One of the biggest differences between followers and fans is that followers listen to Jesus' orders and obey them. Next, we learned that God wants us to remember what the overall purpose of the church is for harmony and order, and that in order for that order to exist, you and I need to be the kind of people who recognize what our role or purpose is, as well as the role or purpose of other people, and then work toward that, work toward that type of harmony. Or in other words, God wants us to be properly disposed toward others in the church and to know that each of us contributes differently to the overall harmony of God's purpose and arrangement. And lastly, we need to remember that God wants us to be orderly and obedient to the authorities he has established in our lives. Or in other words, we as followers should seek to be the best examples of order at school, at work, and certainly within our local communities and country. So as a means of helping us all to stay focused on order this week, I'm going to suggest that we meditate as many times as possible on what Paul said to the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 1.10 I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose.